Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to uh, District and SEIU Collective Bargaining uh, for the 20, for the 2024 um, modifications. My name is Tim Kubrick, I'm Chief of Human Resources. And uh, first I'd like to start with everybody introducing themselves, so. Mark Mitchell, Director in HR. Joseph Sanchez, COO. Heather Frederick, Chief Financial Officer. Jean Marie Middleton, Assistant General Counsel. Kevin McCormick, Director ESE. Jermaine English, Manager Labor Relations. Heidi Gonzalez, HR Partner. Stacey Marshall, Director of Maintenance. Shane Sertro, Transportation Director. Latoya Bunch, General Manager Operations. MJ Steele, Director of the Department of Early Childhood. Jeff Sears, SOL, Maintenance Plan Operation. Doris Motley, Logistics. Sean Motley, Call Center for Maintenance and Plan Operations. Tamika Berry, ECQ2. Julia Reddick, Safety and Training. Cassandra Joseph, School Bus Driver. Alexander Lopez, Chapel Prison. Joyce Lynch, School Bus Operator. Joseph Brenner, SEIU staff. All right. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm glad we're, we're getting started with this early. I think even earlier than we did last year. Uh, we know that the, the contract, new contract, will go in place uh, January 1. So we have some time, but we are looking to hopefully work through this quickly and, and come to an agreement as, as you know, soon as possible. So we share, uh, we share that impulse as well. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so. We have very few items that we're bringing forward uh, today, and but after our discussion, Mr. Brenner, you, you um, we agreed that you would bring your proposals first, so yep. I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. Um, yeah, we've got a number of proposals. Most are tethered to economics. Most are incredibly expensive, as you might imagine. So if you need to get your, if Ms. Frederick needs to get her anxiety out of the way, that's fine. We understand when it's squeeze balls. Um, so we've got um, a wage proposal, um, as well as some ideas on um, a brand new educational incentive, which I know is um, already in existence for our ASOP represented personnel. Um, I'm going to pass around the proposals, and we'll kind of walk through them. I've got two separate packets. I, I made 30. 30 should be enough. I'm also trying to kill a little fewer trees this round. so. I'm you know, not kind of doing the full package, every line. We've got pages that don't include any changes. Um, but if needed, I can you know, provide an electronic copy of the same. Right, that works. Yep. So I'll wait as the uh, proposals make their way around. Oh, and I'm sorry, we have Allison Monblu on online and uh, Danielle Williams as well from our general counsel's office. Great. Ms. Monblau looks like she's not in Florida based off of the double decker level of that house. <laughs> no, <she's good. laughs> this is my house, actually. I had a flat tire this morning and so. Oh. I was hoping you'd say so you were on a, on um, a, a uh, work from home situation in the French Riviera, but it doesn't work that way. That would have been nice. <laughs> That's 30. There's 30. There should be plenty. Uh, over there if you want to. Yeah. 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 
saved one for you. Thank you. Was 30 not enough? 30 was not enough. Dang it. I always walk out of here with We're like good. seven. So I'm like. We're friendly over here. We share. All right. I'll make sure I email it. All right. Um, all right. To go into the proposals now, obviously, um, members of our bargaining unit uh, live, reside in the Palm Beach metropolitan area, which includes the cluster of uh, South Florida. You've got your Broward, your Miami-Dade, your Palm Beach, which according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, based off of July 2022 to July 2023, um, has seen a 6.9% uh, cost of living uh, change, you know, which is not a good thing. Um, and so you'll see the union has brought a proposal uh, to both make up gains regarding the inflation rate um, but also kind of put us a little bit ahead of where we had been previously. Um, so we've, we're proposing a 10% base wage rate increase effective uh, January 1st, 2024, the new contract. Um, in addition, um, we do have some desire because as everybody knows, the brand new uh, $15 an hour minimum wage that was implemented just about a little over a year ago um, really created some compression issues um, within certain groups. So you'll see the custodial four persons, one through five. Um, many of those workers who are doing, you know, demonstrably more um, with their work, and obviously in the instances that they don't have enough coverage, are having to shoulder an even bigger burden. And the distance between those workers and the, the workers that they supervise has gotten very narrow. And in fact, there's been some discussion among some uh, to you know, drop down to custodian as not to shoulder the immense burden they have to do in running you know, uh, their operations. Um, so what we're trying to do is to figure out a way to both create an enhanced distance from the custodians and those who supervise them. Um, and I know it's about 130, 140 different people uh, we'll be talking about based off of my uh, information. Um, I think it, it's more like one per school, isn't it? I think some schools no, some schools yes. I think I'm not the Maybe expert on Maybe based on, on positions. Yes. Yeah. And then in addition to that, we, we've gotten some information from some of our food service assistants at some locations, excuse me, some locations, um, where the amount of duties that the food service assistants are cooking in terms of having a broader and deeper amount of responsibilities in creating a menu, um, we'd like to see effectively the creation, either the creation of a new position at those particular schools that will encompass the enhanced duties these workers have, um, or the effective just reclassification one grade upward to com be commensurate with the enhanced responsibilities of creating the menus. And for, for what job is that? This will be the, um, it's in your second line, the food service Got assistant. Um, okay. At Atlantic High School, John F. Kennedy, Leonard High School, Palm Beach Central High School, and that'll be from grade seven up to grade eight. So how were those? Yeah, say again? How did you select those schools? These are the ones that have the enhanced menus. I can't remember the name, the terminology of it, but. Okay, the re-engineered. Engineering. Re-engineered, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it, it requires them to not just cook, say, seven, eight, nine meals, you know, or sorry, different items. You're doing a much more broader amount of cooking and preparation um, and expertise that's required. The list is missing schools, that's what, that's what I'm asking. Um, and there's probably gonna be other schools that's gonna be done after this one too. So, so maybe we just make the term the re-engineered schools. Great. Okay. Not opposed, these are the ones that have been, I, I don't have the data on which schools have that or not, but these are the ones that have been brought to our attention. You say re-engineering? Yeah, re-engineered. And then in line three of Article 9, um, we desire to provide a uh, CDL stipend for workers who are working in maintenance department that maintain, well, possess and maintain a commercial driver's license, commercial driver's license um, and utilize it for uh, district business. 
I know that that has not historically been something that was provided for these workers. And since these workers have this additional skill which gives them the opportunity to drive heavy machinery, even though it is not job required, um, it does provide an additional um, benefit for the district in ensuring that these workers are able to do that. So on that, you mean if they get pulled to drive a bus, that during that time they get $1 per hour? This is, no, this would be for all hours work. This isn't regarding school bus driving. This is regarding um, heavy machinery. Now, obviously, for school bus driving, they would make you know, the blended rate, I think, which is allowable under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And I know that is occurring in some instances. Definitely, it's occurring in transportation mechanics. Can I ask you a question? Yes. For the maintenance people that you're referring to, um, I'm confused because it is a requirement of the job for like the grounds people. So who, what, what group are you referring to? I know there are some workers that it's not required, but go ahead. So the logistics personnel, you're talking about one person? Okay. So this proposal is, is for just one person? Yeah, but it, potentially it could be, it might be one person now, but it could be many people later. And moving into uh, Article 14, Transportation Working Conditions, there's been a lot of concern over, I'll say, the way that the current um, physical vendor who's working at the on-site clinic, which would be Marathon, has been diagnosing folks in a way that seems radically out of step with previous assessments on workers. And it is effectively putting people out of work even though there's no specific DOT requirement that they have to be, you know, receiving the treatment or being, a di being diagnosed with sleep apnea. And we've got some concerns that there's just this enhanced level of scrutiny, which is not, which is not historically been the case here at Palm Beach Schools, nor is happening at other districts across the state. And what it's doing is it's, it's effectively holding some workers to a standard and not allowing them to continue to do their jobs, uh, which has put several people out. And we wanted to, number one, best case scenario, remove this vendor if they're, perform, you know, they're, if they're running their operations in a way that is not the industry standard, which is effectively just not in step with what has always been happening at this district. And then number two, giving the opportunity for drivers who can get a second opinion, because I think that's something valuable that we're, you know, you get one diagnosis, you can get a second opinion of that diagnosis. Um, so long as it's a DOT certified, um, you know, doctor or physician or physician's assistant, what have you, that a worker can get that second opinion as not to become ineligible to do their daily jobs. And then on Article 29, Section 3, I know we had brought, um, this is a new Section 3, there is not a Section 3 in the agreement currently. Um, there, is, there is an option for an annual sick leave payout in Article 22, Section 13 of the regular agreement um, that allows employees to buy out their, their sick leave, you know, a certain amount, not, it's like 80% of the days. It's, it's effectively an incentive for people to not utilize sick leave unless they're sick. Well, if you remember a couple sessions ago or a couple rounds ago, we, under the full book, the union had brought up an idea, and I know it was not when Tim was the chief negotiator, it was when uh, Vicki evans Pere was the negotiator. We had a scenario where many of our longstanding employees who were effectively close to or at the maximum annual leave accumulation we're put in a situation where they have already taken some time during the year. They've, they're in this position where come end of the school year, fiscal year, you know, June 30th, they've already taken two, three weeks. But because their accrual rate 
is, hi, they're effectively having to make a decision, well, I guess I have to take more time, which is a great thing for some people, but effectively with the shortage of workers in their departments, you know, knowing that there's 10 or 15 different tasks that have to be performed, these, you know, these workers were having to take time they didn't necessarily want to and leave their other, their fellow employees in those classifications in the lurch a bit, and they would rather come to work, be productive, help out with the tasks, rather than just have, you know, have the use it or lose it provision where I don't want to take the time, but if I don't, it evaporates into thin air. And I know a couple years ago, we had had this, here's where I was going on that last couple rounds ago. Um, we had had this discussion about converting those hours into some level of Bencor payment, like you know, basically taking that and putting it into its separate bucket so that the workers could capture all of it, if, well, if not some of it, all of it. Um, I know that wasn't available to be done at that time and may still not be available under the, you know, the agreement that the district has with Bencor, but we do know that if the worker will be could be incentivized to come to work and get some level of annual leave payout that that would both provide the uh, the worker with the ability to you know be productive and take that level of payment you'll see the proposal for us we recognize one thing the district is going to have will be hey you can't just buy out 500 hours we we understand that that would be a heavy burden upon the cash flow of the district but we think that if you can buy out up to 80 hours in a given year that it splits the baby in a way that you know provides that uh, enhanced incentive to our members while not handcuffing the district in their uh, financial position but i will say you know if the bencore option is an option as well if we can revisit that we would we would be we would be interested in exploring that as well and i know in article well article 36 for regular 33 for ecp para and 34 for supervisory under our health insurance, and I know we had explored this at previous times where employee who has coverage via another method could effectively forego that coverage in order to, you know, not be placed in that risk pool and not obviously have to have the district pay for that, um, you know, to carry them under the plan. Now, I do know that there are rules around that. You can't just jump off and on. I don't think our plans ever work that way, uh, but we would like to explore that. Can't that be done already is my question. Yeah, that can be done already. Employees are not required uh, to participate in the district health plan, but you're right. They cannot go off and on. Um, so there are certain points throughout the year. And so if when we're going through the enrollment period, which will be from November 1st through November 15th, uh, any employee who does not want to continue to be part of the health plan next year um, just can decide to not participate through that enrollment period. Okay. And if a worker, like say for example, I think the typical, the name for it is a triggering event where, That's say you're qualifying. qualifying event, that's what it is. Qualifying event where you're, say you've got coverage through your spouse, your spouse changes jobs, you no longer have coverage, you can prove a qualifying event has occurred to get back on it? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Yes, I mean, you have to show that, well, I, we would have to go back and look at our exact rules as to when you can get back on. I think we understand the ask. We'll, we'll yeah. at the next session, bring some information back on that. Okay, appreciate it. And then I have the uh, additional attachment of the current language in the ASOP agreement around providing educational incentive awards. This is something that we had brought up in our bargaining a couple rounds ago. Um, first amongst the paraprofessionals, as folks know now, ASOP uh, paraprofessionals one have the ability to obtain these um, educational and service awards, educational incentive awards, excuse me. Um, and we wanted to do a couple things. Number one, provide that to 
all of the ECP paraprofessionals, many of whom have either achieved this higher level of education and have yet not been able to you know, utilize it in a way that provides them a benefit, so, and some of whom ha are close to obtaining a degree, and this might incentivize them to, in order to do that, and thus make them a lot more marketable and able to be promoted through the ranks here at the district. Um, and in addition to that, we wanted to also provide this for the general bargaining units, all of the supervisors, all of the regular personnel, and all, in, as referenced, the ECP paras, um, effectively because what this does would be providing an additional incentive for employees to help themselves get ahead and thus stay within the district. Now, I, one thing I don't have, and I don't think the district probably has right now, is any indication of how many of our existing employees in any of the three bargaining units have you know, any of these specific incentives, whether there would be a level one basic award um, or the additional coursework. I mean, I think it's kind of an open-ended conversation on that, and we'd have to do a lot of kind of surveying the landscape of who has what and what the impact would be. And that's all we have for today. Um, anything that I've either, on my side, anything that I've either brought up and needs more focus or additional, uh, Alondra? back in and look at the job descriptions, and this is in reference to the um, cafeteria workers at those schools that were named, there's already a position in place. It's a school food service assistant too. So basically, I believe all the school food service assistants are coming in as a one, but the school food service assistant two is a different um, salary level. It's B8. The assistant one is B7. And the uh, production assistant is B9 salary level. So there is already a position there for these um, individuals at those schools. And maybe it would be bumped up to a school food service assistant two. But there does not need to be another... Um, position created, created because yeah. there's already one in the school district system and that's the school food service assistant too thanks for allison thanks for pointing that out allison do you have any input on that or, or wait till next time yeah that's correct yeah, yeah we have the school food service assistant one two and production assistant seven eight and nine levels that is correct thank you Alondra. just just to make sure i'm clarifying on this Food service assistant one would be a grade seven, yes. two would be a grade eight, and then production assistant would be a grade nine? Yes, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. The, the thing that, the, that we have to look at is to see, well, as a two, you know, a lot of the times, it's like you, from, to go to, from a one to a two, you have to have worked a certain number of years. So we have to just look at the job description to, to really you know, digest that before we, we have much, much more to add. So, but we'll have that for next session. No, we, I mean, we would expect you to do your due diligence on that. I think we recognize that obviously the creation, it's a job ladder, right? It would be a one to two to the PA. Those conditions can be changed by the district under specific circumstances, and what we're referring to in our specific circumstances are the enhanced duties in those reengineering schools. Understood. All right, um, I, I will share uh, our proposals with you. There's really okay. not much to it. There one, I guess. Today. Today, all you're going to really see in here, since you know we have, did have a discussion about um, you be going first, so we, we will have for next session, we will have a 
a competitive you know, wage proposal to, to discuss with you. Uh, for this one, the first thing is just the, the preamble, nothing really um, new there. Um, on, the, on the second page where discipline of employees, progressive discipline, it was really just a matter of um, some language that was incorrect. And I'm gonna allow Jermaine, if you're ready to, to touch on this, I think you have a little bit more background on that. I'm sorry, Tim, I was trying to multitask. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're talking about the, um, the changes to progressive discipline. And, and if the grievance procedure is selected, the grievance shall be uh, initialed at step three. That's invalid language from what I understand. Yes, after um, having some conversations with our general counsel, it appears that what we have um, probably should have been stricken from a contract some time ago so it would be in line with what's in the statute. So it really um, no longer allows labor relations to overturn anything that the board has done. Yeah, so I, that's why we're striking that. I know that had come up under some suspensions, demotions, terminations that the union has grieved and then sought through the level three, and yes. the district has said, we don't have the power to overturn a board decision, right. nor do we prefer career suicide in doing so. Exactly. I, I would like oh. to be able to start my car with confidence, yeah. so yes. <laughs> that's, that's my kind of joke. I like <laughs> All right, so uh, on the next page, this is payroll dues deductions, as you know, um, with, this with Senate Bill 256. Um, those ended on July 1st, uh, 2023, so uh, the language we put in here, though, would, in the event there is a change in applicable law in the future, the parties agree to renegotiate these terms upon request by other party. Um, there, there just is a process that we have to go through in order to reinstate something like this. There's fees to, you know, there will be a cost um, to be able to program everything because all of that was discontinued when, when we turned it off. So, so that's just saying we don't really have a, um, any preference, we didn't have an issue with dues being deducted. It wasn't, it's not obviously not our choice. It, our choice is to just follow statute. Um, so that's why it was discontinued. And then the next page is just the form. So again, that would be, you know, something we would be willing to renegotiate should the law change. Quick, quick question. I know, because this is something that we've been in discussion with multiple employers across the state. Some employers, I mean, I see that obviously the district has a right to propose to make a change in the agreement. Um, some employers, we've just decided to leave it alone and leave language as is in the collective bargain agreement. And God forbid, you know, if, if the law changes or is overturned by a court of competent jurisdiction, as it's called, um, then we would just revert to it's allowable under the law, the language is already there. So I wanted to have the district consider that. Obviously, you know, you've got your legal team to discuss that with. Um, I'm always going to be in preference of keeping something in the collective bargaining agreement as much as possible, unless it could harm the parties. Um, but we can keep talking. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go back to um, you know some resources that we have to to see what other districts are doing and, and just how we're handling that. Um, Really, it's, it's nothing more than just compliance for us. Um, and it makes sense, I think, to, to put in there that, but you know, we'll, we'll look into it further and get back to you on that. No, I mean, I, I understand. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. That's all you got? That's all we have. As, as I said, we don't have, we're not bringing forward a whole lot. Um, you know, we, um, we will, next session, bring forward a, a wage proposal for you uh, to review. Um, I appreciate you bringing yours, um, you know, clearly and, and not as many papers this time, right? <laughs> so uh, we will review those though too. And uh, I guess our next step here is to talk about our next session, so. Yeah, is, is there any need from on our end to either have any um, clarity on our proposals from the, from the district's end? Jermaine? Actually, I do have just one quick question. So the educational incentive piece, you're looking to add that to all three contracts? Yes, ma'am. And the language that you gave us is from the ASOP contract. So Correct. you're looking to replace the word ASOP with the appropriate, con okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, and I know, so basically I looked at it last night, I was like, man, I could bring five pages of typed up the exact same thing of what you just illustrated. One thing I do know is in the ASOP language, I think it's Article 6, Section C, 
is that there are some grandfathered aspects of it, which of course wouldn't apply because it wasn't previously agreed to and maintained in the agreement. Um, but yes, it's effectively meant to mirror that benefit that's already being provided to the ASOP unit. So basically everything except for the grandfather piece. Yep, okay. absolutely. That was my question. Now, if you wanna, if you wanna up the amounts, we're not, I mean, I'll, I'll try to twist my members' arms in a way to Mr. Brenner, I would still like to be able to start my car with confidence. Fair enough. So, Fair enough. So we, we will look into that. I just, you know, oh, sorry, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> so I was just looking at the uh, proposal on the custodial four persons, one through five. Yep. So did you also look at how that may affect the, um, the custodial coordinators? We have not dove into the coordinators. But is there, is there an anticipated concern from the district regarding that? Well, I think they're gonna have the same concern about compression as well. So that, that's what I'm gonna be looking at between yeah. now and the next meeting. Yeah. I, I, one thing that we're- you have somebody raising their hand back there. We're, am, we're amenable to diving in. I know the compression has hit every county, every county school district hard in terms of a, you know, used to have a distance between levels of three, five, seven, eight, nine percent. Now it's basically going to be like a two or three percent in some of these instances. So the creation of that distance is a concern amongst pretty much all the supervisory, uh, not all, but many of the supervisory folks. Um, question on that? Right. Comment? Come up. If you want. Okay. I just want to talk about uh, you raised the issue with compression on the schedule that was yep. caused, you know, last year. So it's a district's intent each year when we have increases to start to, to spread that out again. So mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing up one group of employees now. Mm -hmm. That schedule affects all the employees, right? So mm -hmm. the, it's the district's interest for our employees' interest to spread that out. You know, the state did this to us yep. in one year. Unfortunately, we can't fix it in one year, but we will seek each year to expand those those differentials between those. So thank you for that. No, great. Now, that, that brings up a good point. We're really talking not about a position by position. It's more of grade by grade adjustment to create that level separation. Understood. Yep. Yeah. We always had, I was at Pinellas Schools bargaining yesterday, and we were talking about how much the co cost of, you know, doing the same, the impact of the, $15 an hour minimum, it would almost, to, to provide that same level of distance position to position, that we were looking at $40 million over there. Right, that's why we're saying it, it can't fix it in a year, it takes, it takes some time. Right. We could run those numbers actually. The, the, yeah. the state, uh, to their credit, had asked how to do this right, and we provided the figures. Ms. Ms. Frederick can probably quote them better than I can, but we ran them. And uh, it was in the neighborhood to do it right, $100 million for the district to do oh, it. Bigger and district. Uh, we gave that to the state saying, you know, you should increase the allocation so we could address this, but we didn't get that ask answered. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, so we're well aware of the issue, and we'd prefer um, not, to, not to have that issue, of course, but yeah. we, we need to address it, and we absolutely. will over time. Yep, absolutely. We're, we're, we're down for creative ideas. We have a plan. Sounds good, and so um, we, we'll also look at those custodian four persons. I remember last year we did increase those supplements yep. um, quite a bit yep. um, to create some separation because I think that's why those, you're bringing those forward right now, right? Because of the compression to the other positions. Um, we'll also bring uh, forward our, our, our market study data on that because, you know, one thing I wanna make sure that we're doing here when we're, when we're talking about raising specific groups Every single time we do that, we, we have to base it on market data, not just, you know, it's their year or it's somebody else wants more. It, it doesn't work out well if you go down that path. So any sort of increase that we're proposing for one, one group and, you know, including what, what we talked about in the other one where it was one person, um, it, it, we'd need something to, to, you know, show that the market data says this is what we should do, um, with, as we would with any of our, our wage increases. I don't, conceptually, I agree with you mostly. The only thing is I want, I want, I don't want us to just be kind of always beholden to what a sort of nebulous market survey will show us and make sure that we're also taking into account the, the duties and the responsibilities that are being performed by a specific segment of employees, meaning if 
the market might, market data might show, hey, you've got 7% between this grade and this grade, and, and say Broward pays this and Miami-Dade or Martin pays this. However, but if we know that the roles and responsibilities of these folks is not just limited to what are their, their items outlined in their job descriptions, that they're performing enhanced duties and much more responsibilities and have much more floor coverage than is accepted or, or, or thought of in the, stud, in the study, we wanted to be able to be nimble enough to recognize, hey, you've got all stars at these positions. And if they just all of a sudden decide to demote down to not have those responsibilities and maybe lose $1.50, $1.70 an hour, that doesn't benefit the members, that doesn't benefit the district in that regard. So I, I recognize, so I agree in concept, but I know that some, some positions may be outliers within that. Understood. All right, well, well, we'll have something at the next session. Uh, speaking of the next session, any dates um, work for you? Or do you want to send us a list of dates and, and we'll, we'll respond? Well, we've got a minute here. We've got a minute here. I can yep. look. Did, um, do you think next week would be a minimal? Um, we're already set to be, I'm already set to be here on, with uh, insurance bargaining on the um, afternoon of the 21st, I believe. So if we want to do a morning session that same day, we'd be amenable. 21st. 21st. Yeah, sorry, uh, Thursday, September 21st. It, it doesn't appear that the boardroom is available. So, okay. unfortunately, we'd have to meet in the parking lot. Is there a telephone booth available? Is there, I mean, is there, I, we've met in other rooms around here, some training rooms, like Thurber training room, maybe? <laughs> I could do 10.30. Because this um, meeting is recorded because of the sunshine law, it's not possible. So. We don't have to do that. I. Okay, I want you to speak louder for general counsel. <laughs> we, we don't know, because we didn't record our Pinellas yesterday. Shh. We don't typically record them. I know it's sort of practice here, but it's not right. required. Um, I think maybe we'll, we'll that, it doesn't look like that day is gonna work out well for us. We got, you know, with coalition, Beyond that, we don't have a whole lot of times available, but um, maybe we could, you could send us a, a few dates. We can do that. I think that might be easier to, because since we're trying to coordinate a whole lot of people here. Yep. Um, but we do hope to, you know, the next two weeks, at least come back sometime. Um, yep. All right. All right. So we'll send some dates of, of, of you know, that, that we're available and then we'll go from there. Sounds good. Send a group invite out. All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Appreciate your input. And uh, we'll see you at next session.